You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Well, greetings again from Sprott Money News. This is your Ask the Expert segment for June 2016. I'm your host, Craig Hemke, and joining us this month is Brent Cook. Brent is an independent exploration analyst with expertise in property economics and geology evaluations. He is the editor of a great website, explorationinsights.com. He also has a newsletter, uh, Exploration Insights, as well. Brent, thank you so much for joining us this month on Ask the Expert. Welcome, Craig. Always enjoy talking to you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, and, and we've had a number of questions submitted by Sprott Money customers uh, that I think will be fit right into your wheelhouse and your expertise. So if you're ready, we'll just dive right in. Yeah, go for it. Uh, the first question comes, wants to know mainly about modern technology and how that has changed uh, the techniques, really, of prospecting and exploring for gold and silver here in the 21st century. And, and does modern technology make some of the old mines, old assets, potentially viable again? Well, I think... In terms of exploration, uh, modern technology has certainly helped a lot. I would say probably the biggest uh, one technology that's come about is satellite imagery, um, aster imagery, and what that allows us to do is it, it picks off certain wavelengths uh, reflected back off the ground, and with those wavelengths, you can get a sense of sort of what the rock type is, what the alteration is, you can see structure and that sort of thing. So that has been a big help in terms of uh, exploration, where you can go in and know that there's some sort of alteration there. Um, the, the important thing to keep in mind, though, is that that only tells you sort of what the rock is doing, not if it's mineralized or not. So it gets you into an area. Uh, most recently, drones. Uh, we started using drones, and that is extremely helpful in getting out and seeing areas up close, uh, mapping and uh, topography, that sort of thing. So drones are really coming into it now. Um, another would be uh, geophysical techniques where you shoot uh, electricity or, or measure something into the ground and get back readings of what the rock down there is doing, and we've been able to get deeper and deeper so we can see deeper. Um, so those are probably the biggest helps uh, that we've seen in terms of exploration. But I think it's really important to realize that all those things do is tell you differences in rocks. They don't tell you mineralization. And bottom line, and I'm a real proponent of this, is that to really make a discovery, uh, you need to get out there with a rock pick, your boots, and you need a geologist out there with the experience to recognize what is actually on the ground. So, Really, it's still about going out there just like the old timers, a rock pick and a shovel in your eyes. It's just a bit more modern. It still comes down to the expertise and the experience of of the individual, apparently. Precisely, precisely. And I think that's that's never going to change. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. Uh, as we saw the mining shares turn in 2015, I've asked all kinds of experts, you know, what are the most important uh, differentiating qualities from company to company and how can you pick winners versus losers and it's almost always the quality of the management team is one of the key factors is that do you agree with that too indeed indeed it certainly i mean it takes more than just um, being having a guy on the ground who knows what he's looking at uh, that to me is the most important one but then you also need management that knows uh, how to raise money uh, how to promote a stock uh keep the share structure tight, all those things come into it. The bottom line is the guy in the field has to recognize a viable versus an unviable prospect as rapidly as possible. That's probably where most of the money gets raised is you've got guys out there who are, I guess, over-enthusiastic and always seeing a, a, a gold pot at the end of the rainbow. And most of these projects we know aren't going to work. So the key, and what we do in our newsletter is we're always looking for the fatal flaw in a project because um, usually there's going to be one. If there's not, we keep buying it. There you go. I, that's a perfect segue for the second question that was submitted from our customers. And that is, what is a common warning sign or what are some of the common warning signs that an asset or even an entire company just simply isn't viable? 
That's a good good question. It's a whole uh, whole page in its own. Yeah. Um, I think what you look at is, you know, starting with if it is an asset, say it's in a resource, if it requires some sort of propri- proprietary technology or unique technology to recover the metal, be it gold, copper, whatever, that's always a big warning flag. Um, it means there's a problem there with the metallurgy. Um, likewise, if if the resource report that they put out relies on a number of byproduct metals to make this thing work, say you've got a gold deposit, uh, then there's silver and platinum and plate, you know, whatever might be added to it that they need to recover to make this work, uh, that's always a red flag. Uh, take, for instance, zinc. If you've got a zinc deposit and they're throwing in uh, recovery of germanium and, and stuff like that, there's probably a problem. Uh, what else? Market cap versus, you know, and cash versus what the capex of the company actually is. Mm-hmm. So you've got a capex of, or a market cap of $10 million, and the feasibility mm-hmm. shows you need to raise $500 million. That's a problem. <laughs> um, as, as you can see. Also, when management or in the top engineers and mining guys start to leave a project, a company, that's usually a bad sign. Yeah. And I guess finally, uh, this is something that, you know, my, my business partner, Joe Mazumder, worked on and, and put out, was how a project is financed tells you a lot about the quality of it. Um, if, if they can raise debt, uh, that's generally a, a good sign in that, you know, most of the people lending the money do their own due diligence. Or if you go through and it, it requires uh, a lot of equity or a hedge or a streaming deal, that tells you that they couldn't get the best deal and they're working down the, um, the line of options and raising money. In fact, he put out a, a really good newsletter on that, that if, if your uh, listeners are interested, send us an email and we'll send you that one newsletter where he walks through the process of um, equity versus hedging versus uh, a streaming royalty. And just send it to uh, to us via our website. Well, yeah, what's that email address real quick, Brent? I would just, um, on the website, there's a contact us. Okay. Just contact us via that. Got it. And it's explorationinsights.com. And ask for uh, Joe's report on streaming versus uh, debt. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, that, that sounds like something I want to read as well. All right, the next question uh, deals with this in general, the metals and the shares. Gold and silver are both up about 20% year to date. But the big move has been in the shares with the HUI index being up 120, 125% year to date. Uh, Why the difference between the two and is that move in the shares sustainable? Yeah, I think the the big difference in the twenty percent versus one hundred twenty percent is is twofold. The first is that the sector as a whole. You look at the indices, the GDX or GDXJ, they were down over eighty percent at the bottom, some you know close to ninety percent. So in that respect, it was just such a beaten down, battered sector. You had a lot of contrarian investors come in to play that, and I think that's probably the you know the major reason it bounced up. Uh, the second being uh, leveraged, the, most of these companies, producers, or even with uh, deposits, it's the leverage that the, the increasing gold price provides um, to a, a mine. And that you, uh, you know, if you're breaking even at uh, eleven hundred bucks, at twelve hundred bucks or thirteen hundred bucks, you're making three hundred dollars. So that leverage is huge. That's probably the second uh, reason we've seen such a, a big move in the companies versus the actual price. Uh, is this sustainable? I think so, yeah. I think we've seen a turn in the, the precious metal sector for sure and in sentiment towards it. So what we've seen is basically the, all, all boats are floated, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, going forward, though, I think it's going to be more and more critical that you actually buy viable assets or viable companies um i think the you know the rise in general has now occurred and it's going to be a lot more about stock picking right right 
All right. Uh, you mentioned sentiment change. It's another excellent segue, Brent. You're, you're doing a great job at this. Uh, you did, uh, a reader wrote in and said, uh, really appreciated the analysis that you've done in the last six or 12 months and said you did an excellent job at anticipating the change in sentiment in regard to the precious metals. Do you perhaps see a trend change coming in the industrial metals as well, like copper and uh, palladium, things like that? Uh, good question. I think, you know, what we saw in, in November of last year, um, I felt the sector was changing, at least the precious metals sector, and hired uh, Joe Mazunder to come on, who is actually smarter than me and has done a great job. And what turned it to me was just seeing that zero to negative interest rates around the world actually made gold a, a, a reasonable investment mm -hmm. to the uh, general investing public. So that's what's changed it. With regards to the base metals, I near term, meaning this year, I don't see a lot of um, positive out there. We're still looking at uh, a weak global economy, a uh, weak GDP you know, across the globe. So I don't see that turning right now. Uh, I'm certainly looking at base metal projects. Uh, we own a copper zinc company, a couple of those, and a uranium prop company. But uh, overall, I don't see any near-term catalyst that's going to push those higher. And you look at inventories for most of the base metals, uh, they're pretty high with the exception of possibly zinc. So no, near-term, I, I don't see big change there. Fair enough. Got one more specific question that was emailed in that I'd like to ask you about, and then we've got a couple of specific names people wanted your, uh, your uh, I guess, opinion on. But the final question is, uh, has to do with many miners had to, I guess we'll call it high grade, their deposits in order to survive 2013 through 2000, 2015. How has this affected current supply? How will that affect supply going forward? And then lastly, does this make exploration companies a better bet going forward? Oh, that's another good question. Um, yes, they, over the past few years, the major mining companies, gold mining, all of them really, have had to start hydrating their deposits because they're marginal at best. What that means is you jump into a, uh, a deposit and pull out the guts of it, the better part, mm -hmm. and leave the remaining lower grade. What that often means is that remaining resource that was on your books as, you know, gold you had in the ground becomes becomes uneconomic. So, in effect, your resource, your, you know, your resource for the company is declining, has declined. And that's, that's going to be a real problem. I think that re leads right into uh, the second part of that question about is you know, exploration the way to go? And I am... Um, a firm believer that it is. Uh, what we've seen is these companies have not only high graded, but they've cut their sustaining capital, uh, they've cut their development capital, they've almost eliminated exploration, and now they're faced with having to replace those reserves. Um, and it's going to be tough. So we've moved in, in the letter, we, we picked up a bunch of companies early on uh, this year and last year. Uh, four of which have been acquired, and we're moving more into the exploration stage companies uh, with the an anticipating that the major miners are going to have to start buying new discoveries. Yeah, that, that so makes I sense. I think that is the place to be. That is the place to be, in my opinion, where we're focusing more and more of our efforts on. In fact, Joe is just coming back from Turkey uh, today, and I'm off to Mexico to look at some early stage things in uh, on Monday. That would make sense, I guess, as a follow-up. If if you've depleted some of your primary sources as a major miner, that you, what choice do you have but to look for acquisitions to replace some of that those deposits? Right. I think I don't think they're going to actually go and buy these marginal deposits they they did during the last bull market because that was a disaster. Over the past two years, they've written off fifty billion in you know purchases assets. So. It really comes down to they need high margin, high grade deposits, which are very few and far between. So, what we want to focus on is finding those projects 
as early as possible. Like one pro the project I'm looking at in Mexico, basically they've got a few trenches, some rock chick sampling, and some mapping done. But it looks interesting. So that's as early stage as you want to get into. If if it turns out to work, uh, we're looking at ten baggers on something like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, finally, Brent, just uh, some individual names that uh, customers of Sprout Money wanted you to comment on, if you can. And if you don't have any opinion, just just go ahead and say so. The first one is Klondex. And the specific question with Klondex is, I guess they have what they call their tailings reprocessing project. And whether you know anything about that and what you think of it. Uh, actually, I do. I know Klondex fairly well. Um, they've done a fantastic job in the batter. Narrow, high-grade underground miners. Uh, they know what they're doing. I've been to their projects in Nevada. And they've picked up the uh, Rice Lake deposit. Now they're calling it True North that Sand Gold used to have. Um, I was there a while, well, many years ago now. And it is a narrow, high-grade vein deposit that the previous company couldn't get to work. And so they've come in, and their initial program is to do some test dope mining and reprocess some tailings. Uh, the tailings, in my view, are just minimal. There's not, it's not a big deal one way or another. They're looking at something like 8,000 ounces. So I don't think that really is something to focus on with this company. I think watch the test dope mine to see if these guys can turn it around and mine the uh, high-grade veins at True North. That's probably a more critical thing to watch. Okay. The next name that was submitted is First Mining Finance which is run primarily by Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver. What do you think of that one? Um, it's not a play that I'm interested in. What they're doing is acquiring out-of-the-money uh, gold resources, out-of-the-money mean, meaning marginal or uneconomic, in anticipation that as the gold price rises, people are going to be interested in these uh, may become economic. I don't really think that's going to happen, uh, but it may be a good play in terms of uh, just betting on the optionality that these resources in the ground offer. Uh, they've got in the order of, what, now 370 million shares out in the market cap in the order of $250 million. Uh, the share price has doubled, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, if you play, want to play an optionality play with Keith Newmeyer, that's the way to go. My personal preference is to look, you know, go back to what I said earlier. I'm after the real high margin discoveries deposits that a major is going to buy. That's my exit strategy. Right, right. All right. And lastly, the other name was Kalinex Mines. Do you know anything about that one? You know, to be honest, I don't. Uh, I know a bit about it, but certainly not enough to make an, an informed comment on. So I'll have to pass on that one. Sorry. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, Brent, that brings us to a close. Uh, I think, though, you've made a spectacular case for where we might be going from here and the value of what you do. Tell everybody, again, uh, where they can find Exploration Insights and explorationinsights.com, how they can get in touch with you, and if they're interested in subscribing, what do they do? Right. Subscribing's real, real easy. At explorationinsights.com, top right-hand corner is a, a subscribe now button. Uh, we charge on a monthly basis. If you don't like it after a month, just quit. Um, I will say that we are more expensive than most newsletters out there, but that's on purpose. You've got two qualified geologists out there working for you. Um, and, again, if, if someone's interested in reading that report that uh, Joe Mazumder did on financing options and what it means to a project, send us a, a note, contact us through the contact now button and uh, mention that and we'll send it off to you great stuff brent i think this has been extraordinarily valuable and i know everybody listening has garnered some quality information i want to thank you for coming on ask the expert and wish you a great rest of your day well thank you craig i uh, appreciate the opportunity and then maybe we'll see you at the sprout resource show in july i i'm trying to somehow get that one on the calendar it would be fun to get there Brent, thank you so much. And from all of us here at Sprott Money News, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again next month.